Welcome to the History of LAS Care one-on-one sessions. I'm Junior Francis, your host, alongside our producer and my good friend, Eric Kohler. This series celebrates and aim to preserve and promote this care, rock steady and vintage reggae scene in Southern California and beyond through insightful conversation with legends and modern day talent, including those behind the scene. So when you listen to, uh, to this podcast series or watch us on YouTube, many thanks for your support. For this uh, special episode, we welcome two members of the popular LA-based spunk punk outfit, the interpreters, who also happen to be twin brothers, drummer Jess and bassist Justin Bovena. I should have asked you the pronunciation before. They are truly our rhythm twins when it comes to skia, rocksteady, and early reggae. Welcome, guys. Uh, big Thank congratulations. You Yes. yes, yes, yes. Junior, the thank you. wonderful. Junior, thank you for the uh, introduction. And uh, yes, sir. Jesse and Justin, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being here. And um, uh, interrupters, right, as opposed to interpreters. Although like maybe we get it all the time. It happens all the time. Or maybe, or maybe they do interpret. Maybe they speak other languages. We can find that out. <laughs> so Funny. it's in, 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 uh, interrupters. Interrupters. Funny story. When we just we did James Corden, he said interpreters in his live thing, and he had to go back and re-record it. We were <laughs> backstage like, oh no. <laughs> Hey, junior, 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 we're in good, we're in good company with James Gordon. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah, yes. So, Eric, uh, why don't you go ahead with the first question, sir? Yeah. Well, first, first, uh, we Junior and I want to um, welcome you guys and and just give you a big uh, congratulations. You've had a um, huge year, twenty twenty two, even even before that. But I know this year alone, touring wise, you know radio singles just just overall a lot of hard work and 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 sweat and tears i'm sure on the road so um uh, big congratulations to you and and uh and to kevin and amy and everyone else um on on all the accolades well deserved um thank you very much yeah absolutely um so speaking of which we'll, we'll dive into our first question describe the feeling you first felt when you heard um whether it was maybe the first the first single or a single on, you know, such a powerhouse radio station, say for instance like K Rock, right? Um, what is it like when you first when you first uh, uh, hear a song, or or maybe see you guys, you know, your mugs and your your a photo of you all on a major international magazine? Um, what does that feel like? It's really hard to describe because yeah. like growing up our whole lives, listening to the radio to our favorite bands or buying magazines with you know, articles about our favorite bands and reading them and looking at them. And then you you get to a point where that's you on the other end. And it, mm -hmm. it's surreal. It's surreal. It's surreal. Like we've gotten in the car, just like go to the grocery store and K-Rock's in the middle of playing our song. And we're just like, oh, what? like it never gets old. You just turn it up as loud as you can. And you're like, wow. And then you wait for the end of it to see if they say something cool. And you're like, yes, this, this is it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could. I can imagine how that how that feels, um, um, and, and I guess and I guess on that front, you guys you guys grew up here. Yeah, we grew up in Van Nuys in the Valley here, north of Los Angeles. Uh, pretty much our whole yeah all, our whole life. We went from Van Nuys when we got old enough. We moved to North Hollywood, and now we're in Sherman Oaks. So uh, we never left the Valley. Never left. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and never, and never left. Oh, sorry. Go, Junior. Go ahead. Oh, I wasn't saying anything. Where you make? Go ahead. Make your point. Yeah, I was just gonna say. So, so on that on that point too, paint a picture of what it was like growing up in, in a Bavona, and then that's correct. Bavona is that? Yeah, Bavona. Bavona. In a household, because not only was it the two of you, but obviously your brother Kevin. Um, uh, describe was it a was it a big musical family? Yeah. So. Our dad is also a musician. He plays trumpet and trombone, but professionally he was like a, he worked for television studios as a, audio. as an audio mixer in the promo department. Uh, so we always had a studio in the house and there was always instruments around the house. Mm -hmm. uh, our parents got divorced when we were really young. So then we had two houses to live at and our okay. dad's house was always the musical house. Not to say that like our mom's house wasn't, but like the drum set was at my dad's. <clears throat> <laughs> the studio was at our dad's house. So splitting our time between the two was a lot of our upbringing. But um, mm -hmm. we weren't but ever... 
forced into the music. It was just available. And uh, we all gravitated toward our own instruments pretty much. Like, yeah, like really early on, Kevin started playing drums. But then after doing like a couple gigs, he realized it was too much work taking drums everywhere. So we switched to guitar. And at the same time, then Jesse started playing drums. I started playing bass. And then we would try to like play songs together as like a three piece. And this is when we're young. We're like, yeah, yeah, how old? Yeah. Six or seven, eight years old. Kevin's like nine, 10, 11. Yeah. Okay. He's three years older than us. So we just, as little kids, we just, whatever we heard on the radio, we wanted to play. So growing up in Southern California, it was K Rock. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, Green Day and the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Sublime, Offspring, Offspring and Blink 182 and whatever else they were playing, we wanted to play like that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and it wasn't until we went to like uh, middle school in the sixth grade and we actually started <laughs> went for studying I, music in school. Oh, uh, so you studied music yeah. in school? Interesting. Uh, I I think Eric and I would be remiss though not to ask you guys to name the other members uh, in the group or the band. Oh yeah, so our older brother Kevin is a guitar player. And yes, let's give some props and acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. On, and songwriter. And then Amy is the lead singer and also songwriter. And uh, they're married. So she's our sister in law. Yep. So mm-hmm. we're all four of us are a family. We live together. Mm-hmm. Like, we're in our studio right now and we all live right here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's very ancestral. Like we've been together for over 10 years now. And I think it's a big part of the reason we've gotten to where we are is because yeah, tight we, unit, tight very unit. Tight. We all have the same goals from the very early on. We all invested pretty much our lives into this project. Like, mm-hmm. so. <clears throat> but there are still other members. Is it is it a four piece band? Oh yeah, yeah, so it's a four piece band live. So we have Billy Cottage who plays keyboards and trombone with us. Right. And, um, so, so now we're we up to five. Yeah, so five. Four. Yeah, so live we're a five piece, but we're really the four of us in the main four. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, so how do you play ska without a brass session section? Well, I think that's why you 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 have right. You have uh, who you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's funny because even before we had Billy playing with us live we always had our dad play on every record. Like he played on our first record, our second record, our third record. Oh, wow. He would play trombone or trumpet. So there was always, on the fourth and he's on the fourth record too. So there was always a horn aspect to a song or two on the record. Um, I don't know why when we, I don't know, when we first started the band, it was just the four of us and we, we didn't ever think like, oh, we need a horn. Just our approach was like, it was more from the songwriting aspect. So when Kevin Amy would write the song and then we would put all the pieces together it was like that's how it would come together and we never had like the oh we have to put a horn on this until there was a song where you're like oh a horn would sound really cool here <laughs> and then we were in. um yeah i don't know we're just always trying to make dance music so as long as you have a drum a bass mm-hmm. a guitar and some vocals with some harmony is like pretty basic for there uh, you go and yeah. a song i think we try yeah. to supplement the lack of horns with a lot of background vocals exactly <laughs> yeah there we go right yeah well so so um <clears throat> what what age do you recall where you were first first exposed to say jamaican music whether it was ska or reggae okay well when the i would say high school was when we were first aware like okay so we have a really good friend and patrick morrison whose brother is devin morrison who was from the experience yes mm. we, know devin, so, we know devin very well yeah. Exactly. So we've known Patrick since the third grade. Um, maybe the second, maybe the second grade. Wow, I did not know that. Okay. And then yeah. around, so around like the ninth grade, I mean, we were, we we're all really good friends. We all listened to punk rock growing up and we, we were, um, we always wanted to play in bands together. And then around like the ninth grade in high school, he started giving us mixtapes of Jamaican music, ska, rock steady, reggae, blue beat, like everything. Cause that was him and Devin's like special. Yeah. Sure. Here. And they knew everything about it. I remember he gave me a CD with a very scribbly writing that said 45s from Devin. Yeah. And I was like, you just digitized a bunch of 45s? And he's like, yeah, well, Devin did. And these are these are them. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because they grew up in the Valley. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's like, we went to elementary school with Patrick. And, yeah. uh, wow. 
we and know their father, it. their father is very musical as well. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So we've known each other for 25 years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So he started giving us tapes and yeah. but with that said, growing up in Southern California, listening to K-Rock, like yeah. sublimes on the radio. No doubts on the no radio. No doubts on the radio. Like it's not exactly Jamaican music, but they are sure. The, you know, yeah. it's the 90s ska movement. And like yeah. it, it's always there. And then listening to punk rock, ska is always in the peripherals. So, but it wasn't until the ninth or tenth grade when Patrick was like, here's these CDs this is what ska really is this is rock steady yeah here's reggae and these are you know, we're getting history lessons on it from them yeah. that was a uh, yeah so around like age 14 15 those are some great a guys. young professor yeah. patrick <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i know and then from that from musicologist that, yeah and then from that at that time uh he was giving us the cds because he wanted to start a band so we did start recording we tried to start recording some ska music in like when we were 15 and it wasn't great, but we were trying and then like we'd cover Prince Buster or uh, well, we did like a Yabby You song. Oh, deep. Just because I had a studio, we had a studio at our house so Patrick would come over. He'd be like, let's record this song and we'd cover it and that was that. And then we had other friends in our circle that we also grew up with that uh, played music. So they'd come over and we'd start, we started a band that was the beginning of the I officials. Oh, wait. So oh, were, were you guys, yeah, were you guys I I officials? yeah. So yeah. we that's how we started the I officials. Oh. I did not play bass in the officials, though. Yeah, you played, bro played bass. I played keyboards. <laughs> he played keyboards. Oh. So, yeah, so we started that with Patrick, our friend Dylan, who we also grew up with. Uh, he played bass. Um, he's currently like out touring with a guy named Trevor Hall. Oh, yeah. And the, oh. The, the trumpet player for the I officials is a guy named Zach Meyerwitz. And he's currently the trumpet player for Revolution. Um, but around 2005, 2006 is when we were all, we all got together and started playing ska, rock steady, reggae, mm -hmm. and just learning other people's songs before we started like writing our originals. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. I saw, I saw I, I officials play. Um, was it Blue Bee Lounge, maybe? Yeah, yeah we, we did, did a lot of Blue Bee Lounge. We did our first yeah. one in yeah. 2007. And then, yeah. and then a good buddy of of, of Junior and mine, um, uh, Sean and his wife Arlene, had Bar One in the Valley. Yeah. There. Yep. And, yeah, I think I, you guys played there, maybe. But wow, I what is small? I had no idea. Okay, that that that's that's really cool. Yeah. So how long was I officials around? So our first show was technically in 06. We played a backyard party, but then our first Blue Beat Lounge april of 07 that was technically our first legit show and then from april of 07 until the beginning of 2012 because then like when interrupters kind of started we kind of shifted like when we started the interrupters we were playing in four other bands so yeah. when interrupters started it was that focus of like okay now we have sure let's focus on this i think this is where it's gonna go and but it wasn't just us the other members of the band also had other things going on like people were in college we all started moving away from each other. So we didn't disband. We're all still very close, still very close friends. But we still uh, talk about playing. We still talk about yeah. playing shows all the time. We did a reunion in 2016 at the Echo. At the Echo with Chris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, we'll one of the um, Blue Bee Lounge nights uh, over there at the Echo Plex, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But yeah, but the Blue Bee Lounge was like in high school for us. That was our, our favorite thing to go to. Yeah. Like, big like, shout out to Chris Murray. Big yeah, shout out to yes, this and the knitting factory, which I miss. Yes. I'm glad he's to hear still this. busy. Yeah, yeah, he is busy. Yeah, man, still active, still touring. Yeah, yeah and I, I think just... the Blue Beat, the Blue Beat Lounge is now uh, online. Uh, yeah, when yeah, he, he does... does something online, yeah, I'm yeah, he does, he does like a weekly, 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 uh, a weekly podcast, twice right. a week. yeah, like live session, yeah, mm -hmm. right, yeah. The... But it was also another band, right? Uh, I think uh, the Telecasters. Right, correct. So, so Telecaster started. Well, I guess Telecasters was uh our old was Kevin's band. Um, when he was in high school, it was him and his friends. They went by another name called the Hutton Brothers because it was Kevin and his two friends Dash and Tim Hutton, um, drums and bass respectively, and uh, they were a trio. <laughs> but when they would play, they'd have an iPod that had a click track on one side, and then keyboards, extra guitars, and vocals on the right side, and they play to these tracks. And they got sick of that, so they called well, us and said, Justin, you're going to play keyboards. Jesse, you're going to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And so that was in 2008 
the end of 07, beginning of 08 was when we joined Telecasters. I played guitar, he played keyboards. Kevin played guitar, and then Dash was drummer. Tim Hutton was bass player. And we did that. For... And that was more like rock reggae. Yeah, that had more of like a heavy rock pop vibe, but still trying to get like Elvis Costello influences and Beach Boys influences yeah. and police influences. Yeah. I think how, long, how about your parents? So your parents feel about the path you guys have taken? They're they're stoked yeah. on it. I mean, I, as a musician, our dads have like so proud of what we've accomplished. But with That's that big support, he really wanted us to go to college. Yeah, there were definitely some years at the beginning where there was questioning about what our path would be like. Mm-hmm. You know, the, and like so, like the once it started getting successful, then there was more acceptance. Like, okay, I understand why you didn't go to college now. <laughs> <laughs> and we tried for a year, and during that year, we were just distracted by trying to play music. Yeah, like we went to see for, for one year, and uh, that was when we joined Telecasters. Okay. So there was like splitting our time between like trying to do class, but then trying to write songs, practice songs, yeah. play shows. And uh, after a year, we just gave up and we were like, we're just going to focus on on music because we were spending all of our time in a studio recording other bands while <clears> working <throat> on our own music. And so we just pick up all the odd jobs that were available. Because yeah. growing up in L.A., you kind of meet people who are you, you pick up skills doing whatever like i don't just play drums i can play guitar i can play keyboard but i can also work on a film set if i want <laughs> well, those are those are great skills i can stay with you forever yeah yeah so, you, know? so you mentioned some of the bands that you heard growing up on on the radio um but what are what are some la or orange county or or, or, or inland empire type bands that you might have seen live that that made a lasting impression on you that might have carried over to kind of some of your influences and some of what you do with with interrupters. Or are there any are there any bands, whether it's Jamaican influence or not? Ooh, like any good. local any local bands? Uh, or maybe that just that, that you're just a big fan of, even. You know, I don't know. It's hard to say, but I, you know, early on when we first started going to Blue Beat, one of the bands that we would always see at every LA like ska reggae show opening at the time was the Agri Lights. <laughs> and at that time, they brought such an energy to the yeah. stage, to the crowd, that I just remember always being so excited to see them and just having the, the best time ever. They and, would, Agri Lights would kill it on stage. Yes. I, yeah. I remember being able to go see them play a show and we didn't even own their records but i still knew the words of their songs yeah and then they get to the beatles cover they <clears> down, <throat> they and our, me down yeah we yeah, are so we were still big beatles fans it blew our mind and then so like we'd see yeah i'd sing them countless times we go to shows we'd be like who's opening this show i don't know we'd be going to see some jamaican artist and we'd be like who's opening the show and then it was the agrolites we're like oh okay sure. it was yeah. like it was even before their their main record came, <clears throat> record came out yeah so we we went down to Tijuana. When, when it comes to uh, stage presence, agorize they take second place to no one. Yeah, yeah. They yeah, used to come was... out. They'd have those jumpsuits on, all matching. Yes. Yeah, and they would just hit that first downbeat, and the entire room would just like bounce. <laughs> yeah, no, they're they're those guys are amazing. I I <clears throat> even right now I get my a haircut by Jesse the barber. Nice. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just recently interviewed for this for this series, uh, Roger. Then about a year ago, we we talked to Jesse, and um, I know that they're both also big fans of uh, of you guys. And I think I think Jess, I think maybe they both saw you guys at the last uh, sh- last show um, at Five Point Amphitheater. Yeah, yeah, we did. We, we hung saw- out with Jesse for a little bit. After yeah, that. yeah. I think I saw some photos out there. Um, and then <laughs> and then maybe maybe a punk rock bowling. You guys were out there a few years ago as yeah, well. We did a oh, show yeah. with Agro Cats, which was like this Agro Light Hep Cat. Oh yeah, and 2015. That was yeah, 15, 14. Yeah, 15. It was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun too. Yeah, I can't go wrong with Hep Cat, and we're gonna we're gonna get around to talking about Hep Cat as it relates to to yeah, um, again. Uh, well, back to you, just like your previous question, another band that we see every opportunity we could back in 2004, five, six, seven, whatever. When they were actually like playing a lot more, yeah. uh, now, it, now it's a treat when they play. Yes, back then, yes. It was like they at least played once a year or something. But to add back to go back to your original question about like first hearing Jamaican music and us telling you about Patrick Morrison giving us all those CDs around the same time he was giving us all those forty fives. That's when we were also diving into Hepcat and the Slackers and the Scatolites. 
Yeah. And then those we just had like a book of those CDs that we would ride the bus to school with. And then every morning was which which one am I going to listen to today? And it'd be like what scientific or wasted days or oh, today foundation is- sky. Like <laughs> yeah. what, a, what a music education right there. I mean, yeah. and the bus ride took an hour, so we had time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So when did you guys first met Tim Armstrong? I know your brother Kevin had worked with him on the legendary Jimmy Cliff's Grammy winning Rebirth. I think that was in 2011. Got, right. uh, it got Jimmy the Grammy. Uh, tell us about that. So Kevin auditioned uh, as a keyboard player for the Transplants in 2005 and got the job. So he went on the warp tour in 2005 with the transplants as their keyboard player. Um, so that's the origin story of him meeting Tim. Um, it was literally an audition. Like he, he, a friend was like, you should audition for this band. And it, Kevin, we were all huge Rancid fans, huge Hellcat fans. We grew up listening to all that stuff. Yeah. He auditioned, he got the job. He went on tour. Uh, I think that was the only tour the transplants did. And then they kind of disbanded it after that. But Kevin stayed in touch with Tim Armstrong. He stayed in touch with Travis Barker. And became their his their studio engineers like for different mm-hmm. projects. Okay. Travis would have something going, and he they he call Kevin, and Kevin would come, engineer or play guitar or whatever. And Tim same thing like Tim would have a recording project and call Kevin, and he'd come and slowly Kevin kind of became Tim's day to day recording engineer, and then that helped and that kind of turned into um, well not turned into but then Tim started doing. He had a project called Rock and Roll Theater in <clears throat> around 2010. Yeah. And that's when he invited us in to play on some tracks. Wow. And also we can record an engineer. So sometimes we'd take over for Kevin if Kevin was busy doing something. And it just became this, we just all became really close and we'd just pick up whatever work we could. And we when Tim needed something, we'd be around. And it's, it's kind of the only way to explain it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, close family. interestingly, yeah, you know, yeah. in, in when that album came out, a uh, friend of mine who used a uh, professor, friend of mine who moved from Claremont to Michigan, sent me, uh, Martinez sent me the CD and said, Junior, you gotta listen to this. And I saw the first track I picked was the Joe Higgs song that um, the world is upside down, yeah. And I said, Yes, this this has Grammy written all over it. And sure enough, <laughs> straight yeah. to the ground. Uh, it's still, uh, it's honestly, it's one of our favorite records. And you know, oh, it has to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know how you hear a lot of artists talk about how they work on some music and they put something out oh, and then they care to do it after. Yeah. Especially Kevin with this, we put it on backstage before we go on stage. Right? Nice. We listen to it so frequently because Jimmy is that amazing. And the band that Tim put together for that record is amazing. It's just so a great wild. record. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I saw. I was at that Coachella when um uh when when they played so Kevin I played Kevin tambourine. Was... Oh, you did nice. Okay, yeah, so I was just standing next to Scott Abel's hi hat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was guitar yeah, Scott, right. Scott on drums, uh, Jay Bonner on bass, right? Yep. Yeah. Original Agarlite. Um. Yeah. That... Piano. Right. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that was super cool. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. big, big respect to everyone there. And then talk about. Oh. Yeah, Dan Bullard. Right. Yeah. Um, and Dan obviously was, it was a huge influence also on Agrilites, him, him coming from dynamic pressure, right? Also, he was the original keyboard player of the interrupters. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. He played our very first show with us and a handful of them in the first couple of years, but he, he was too busy. He couldn't commit, but he was yeah. amazing. No, he's, 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 he's one of the best for sure. Yeah. Um, talk yes, about meeting, months. talk about meeting, um, Amy. Okay, so in 2009... In 2009, the Telecasters got uh, an opportunity to go on a tour that was Sugar Ray, The Dirty Heads, and then Amy was promoting a solo record that she had just put out. Okay. So the Telecasters got on the first of four for like a week on the West Coast. And um, day one, we were in like a field, where is it? The Pozo, Pozo Saloon, Saloon in like Santa Margarita, California, up in the middle of the state somewhere. And um, that was the first day... Kevin just watched Amy set and like fell in love with her songwriting and her voice. And for the tour, they would like talk about writing and stuff. So they kept in touch. And then afterwards, like a few months later, she was coming to LA and called him, asked if he wanted to write. So they got together, wrote some songs. And that session was kind of where they wrote easy on you and gave you everything. And like P 
pieces of like in the mirror. Yeah. Oh, and okay. So there was a lot of really good stuff at that first session. And then she wanted him, she was going to start recording a new record and Kevin was going to produce it. Went into the studio. Jesse played drums. I played a little bass. Probably did, some keyboards. Probably some keyboards. Did it like a full record. Recorded like 11 songs. 11 songs. And then realized that we wanted to try to do a band as like the four of us instead of Amy doing like a, she didn't want to be a solo artist anymore because it's too much of that like you're the only person everyone's looking at it's you know like, like mm. all the responsibility lies on you there's nothing like it's not it's it's a lot of stress to be yeah. and she was band. never like she never wanted to be a solo no, artist. she, always she wanted... grew up like wanting to be in a band she played in bands and then like came to LA and had a band and got kind of like it's kind of a long story, but she got taken. And the industry is the not industry time. kind of <laughs> shoot her up and spit her back out. And just, mm -hmm. I'm glad we found her yeah. when we did though, because so then they pretty much scrapped that whole solo record, and we went back into the studio, the four of us, and started doing this project. At the time, we just started calling the Interrupters, and it was just really like very Op Ivy influenced, fast punk ska. Um, very straightforward, very, very straightforward. simple, as I would say. We recorded that first record, we did like three days of instrumentals, and then the vocals, I think they did in two days. Yeah. And that was that first record. We finished it. Was, what year? What year would that have been? So we've recorded the first record in October 2011, but it didn't come out until August 2014. So it was done, it was done sometime in 2012. Yeah, and like summer of 2012 was when we wrapped it up. But then and there then was... We, we didn't play our first show though until October 2012. Yeah. So we had a whole record done and we started playing shows. And then uh we didn't print up the whole record. We printed up seven inches. And Tim took us on tour. Uh in 2013, Rancid was doing a whole summer tour. And they offered us the was it it was two of the three legs. Because I think there yeah. were three legs. Yeah, it was like the West East Coast or something. Yeah, yeah. So that was our first tour and uh, pretty much our first national exposure was going out opening what the first leg was and, and those early those early recordings were there on epitaph yeah, yeah they did eventually come out on epitaph um yeah so for people who are uh, perhaps may want to look for them uh, where exactly can they be found especially now that they're such a big thing i mean globally about yeah. the 45 so, release those recordings are still are, available? Yeah, yeah that's our debut record that's our self-titled Album The Interrupted mm -hmm. from 2014. Um, it's on Spotify, Apple streaming. You could, I think you could buy the vinyl still on our website. And all yeah, that. yeah. But that's the album that has Take Back the Power and Friend Like Me and This Is My, my family, family and Easy on You. We covered so, so that Apple was album. so that was released on Epitaph. Epitaph okay. and Hellcat. Uh, I think it was August 5th, 2014. Yeah. So you were so you were were you signed by by Tim prior to going on tour and opening for him? Yeah, uh, technically yes. It was there like was, it was a handshake deal. It was like a verbal thing where we <laughs> talked about it. Yeah. But really quick, I don't want to skip over. Before we went on that tour, Tim though, we played a bunch of like um, Elvis Cortez, the Left Alone. Oh yeah, was the first person to book us in shows. So he got us on. We did like some Scalloween and a couple of local LA ska shows, and then we went up the coast and did a couple other shows in California. We got to do Gilman Street. Yeah, and Elvis was like our guy. He he printed our merch. He rented a our his van to us so that we could go play out of town shows yeah. he was just our he was he helped us so, so much at the beginning and he's such an important person in the ska scene because yes he's been at it for so long and he's like he when i think of diy i think of elvis, elvis Cortez. Cortez, yeah. <laughs> yeah i, was I like when you guys speak up each other's door my goodness yeah <laughs> i was talking to somebody recently and his name came up um i think lewis from steady beat brought his name up on, on to, uh, for some reason recently so um yeah Fascinating. So, so how, so, so backing up real quick, how many, um, how many years did you uh, perform as the interrupters prior to that coveted opening slot with, with Rancid? Uh, less than one. Okay. Yeah. It was, uh, that's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. I know it was a wild thing. Cause also like, so at the same time, Justin and I were playing in Sugar Ray. We had gone from being Sugar Ray's guitar techs to being their drummer and their bass player. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a whole summer tour with them in 2012. And we were supposed to go do a whole nother summer tour with them in 2013. Um, but we had lunch with Tim one day and he was like, hey, I think you guys need to focus on the interrupters and I want to take you guys on tour. Wow. 
which means you can't do the Sugar Ray toy. And for us, it was a hard decision because we were we were well employed by Sugar Ray. Right? <laughs> and 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 Junior, um, sorry, um, real quick, Junior, just so because so, um, you may not be too familiar with Sugar Ray, but you will know this one song, "Fly," that features Supercat, right? Um, it was on it was on K Rock back in the day. I'll play it for you next time. Next time we're together. Uh, but... Yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So that's a sort of a crossover. Uh I mean, big, really big. Fred Reagan? No, no, no. Sugar Ray. More Don Saw. Don Saw Reagan. No, more like an alternative rock, but. but So alternative. Like they started as a, like a new metal rock band kind of. And then they just kind of got lucky with a hit song called Fly. (laughs) And it was like a poppy reggae song. So then they kind of made a shift. But uh, yeah, they, they were very successful in the late 90s. And great dudes. Like, yeah. That's the other thing is we like Mark, hanging out with them. They were just great people to Mark, be Mark around, be on a tour with. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. So that was in 2013. We we had to we had to quit that very cush job <laughs> and get in a minivan with Kevin and Amy, <laughs> one other person, and follow Rancid around the country. <laughs> <laughs> was there any, any hostility or animosity when you said you guys could make the tour with them? No, no, no uh, animosity because it was honestly it's what we always wanted to do. Like we when we got the the Sugar Ray job, we knew spoiled yeah. right off the bat. Like yeah. there was no two ways about it. Like we got we were on a bus tour, actually getting paid and playing with a legendary band. Well, like legendary to me because I grew up listening to them on the radio. Sure. But uh so then to be like you're going to just leave all that behind and <clears throat> get in a van and go play to a bunch of people who have no idea who you are but they might like you. yeah um, and and uh how did the interrupters name come about oh so that was <laughs> when we were st- so when we were starting the project we were brainstorming hundreds of names we had like a, a one of those composition notebooks with pages and pages of ideas none of them were landing and then one night our mom came up to visit um kevin and amy and she was um hanging out for dinner or something and she's very like t- like talkative and like excitable where she'll like jump in the middle of a conversation <laughs> and so when she left amy goes to our brother goes to kevin and goes wow your mom's such an interrupter and they both looked at each other, <laughs> that's it with the interrupters so that's the origin right. of- yeah, you <laughs> yeah your mom won't see this so she won't be offended <laughs> no no uh, she knows the story she loves it <laughs> yeah. What I want to ask, maybe we can shift focus a little bit and uh, share with us. Uh, so, what is particularly unique about your writing and recording process, especially for greenhorns, newbie, and you know people who are trying to get into the industry? I think the number one thing that's most interesting is that we record live. At least bass, drums, and guitar are always recorded live together as one unit. <sighs> We don't do drums and then overdub bass and then dr- guitar. Like it's got to be together because nice. we like to try to capture that energy that we have on stage together. So playing together is the best way to do that. And then even to the point like Fight the Good Fight, our third record we did in Tim's studio to tape, which wow. was a really fun experience, really difficult, but also really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Difficult then, in what sense? Um, in the sense that tape, you know, so. Tape's expensive. Tape's expensive, so we don't have a lot of it. And if we got, uh, like, we did two takes, then we'd be like, how was that? And they'd be like, ooh, I don't know. I think we could do one more. It's like, okay, well, which one do you want to delete? And it's, like, <laughs> wow. it's not like Pro Tools. It's not like you just keep recording. <laughs> exactly. And put, put it on a different hard drive. It, it was literally, like, Jay Bonner was our tape op, yeah. which was awesome. Yeah. And uh, we, yeah, we do two takes. And we like, I think we could do one more. He's like, well, should I record over the first take or the second take? <laughs> we're like, oh, my God. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Man, let's listen back. Maybe we got it. Yeah. But, but so it, that process is really <laughs> challenging for that reason. You yeah. need to tell your parts. You couldn't really punch in if you messed up. <laughs> um, no. But there's like, we did Kerosene live, and the vocal for She's Kerosene is actually the four of us playing live with oh, Amy Singh. Wow. Okay. So that yeah. was really fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's unique because I'd also say one of the unique things, which I don't know if anybody else could i don't know how to explain it but like the three of us brothers growing up and playing music together we all can communicate without actually talking to each other like i bet 
when Kevin's got a song that he needs to show us, like we all have the same vocabulary musically and even like unverbally, if like we shoot each other a look, we know what each other we know what the other one wants. Us even more so than with Kevin. Right. Like we're the, twins. We can just Well, that's yeah, and that's powerful and super helpful on stage too. <laughs> yeah. Especially being the rhythm section. Yeah. yeah definitely noticed that. So just being that kind that type of synchronicity is very unique. Um, and it actually is what draws me to other bands that have. <laughs> no, but, but like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? Eric. I mean, just, I, I'm a big fan of Kevin and Amy's songwriting together as a team. Yeah. Right. We try not to overcomplicate things. Like simplicity has always been key. Like if you listen to our first record, it's very straightforward. Like the drum beats are just like four on the floor, like boom. Yeah. Yeah. The, like going crazy with the bass lines. I don't know how he got away with that. He's playing yeah. maybe too many notes. Too many notes. But it's very record. straightforward, punky ska. Like right. I was, uh, there was a leash on me. It was it was it was a known thing that like I can't do crazy drum fills if I'm gonna fill into the something like that. Like I think it's fascinating that so for two of the most popular songs on our record are back to power mm -hmm. and this is my right. One's a punk song, one's a Scott song. They're the same drum. If you listen to them, they're the same drum beat. Oh, interesting. Boom, cut, boom, cut, boom, cut. Yeah, it's just one's got a driving Ramones guitar going and the other one's got upbeats. Right, and that changes. You know? that changes. So that type of simplicity. Right. And, yeah, that was the first record. Second record was like, let's open up a little bit more. Third record, we can open up more. And now on this most recent record, we really went we went out of the box yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah, i love because yeah, it it's really fun maybe. yeah right um, um so let's, speaking of songs let's talk about if i'm not mistaken she's kerosene is is could could easily be considered as your breakout song right your, your single right the the, the Absolutely. kind of that puts you on the map to the masses what what is special and why do you think that it was that song that 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 radio programmers took to and that oh. fans took to I honestly don't know. I mean, it's a catchy, it's a great, it's a great song. I'm not questioning. I'm just curious as to, as to your take on it. Um, You know, I really don't have an answer for it. If I knew, I think we you would all, we'd have way more songs like that. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting was fair, it was, for those recording sessions, it was the first song fully <clears throat> for Fight the Good Fight. So the way Fight the Good Fight was recorded, we went in in September of 2016. 20 to, Says. no 2016 september and did three weeks of pre-production with tim 17 huh. 2017. 2017 sorry yeah. yeah 2017 did three weeks of pre-production which was us recording like 18 songs that was to pro tools that was just us getting ideas out and then we went on tour for october and november and december and then we went back into the studio with tim in january to re-record the best of those songs to tape for the record but with that Kevin and Amy had more songs that they had written over that three month span of a break, but kerosene was always there. It was there in September, pretty much fully fledged out. And it was the first song we tracked when we went back in January. Mm -hmm. And then while we were working on the record, uh, like Tim's obviously there every day. He's producing. We're, we're working together, but Brett Gerwitz came in one day just to check oh, in yeah. and he wanted to hear some things. Right, he's the head of Epitaph Records. Yeah, and uh, we he sat down and we only had a few things for him to listen to because we weren't that far along. But Kerosene was one of them, and he listened to it and he had a little notepad, and he wrote on his notepad, H I T with a question mark. He wrote hit <laughs> with a question mark, and we were all looking over his shoulder. We're like, oh what? Rick Rivers thinks this song's a hit. Yeah. How's that? What? <laughs> and, and sure enough, it's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it was the song wasn't even finished. We didn't we had we didn't have the outro yet. It was the bridge was still kind the of all bridge over. was still kind of all over the place. So it it I don't know. We just struck lightning with that one, I guess. Yeah. They always say mm -hmm. to start your songs with the chorus because that's what people like. So maybe that was it. <laughs> I'm taking notes so for my next song. Um, <laughs> 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 so yeah. what is it like working with Tim? Share some stories with us, eh? 
good or bad. <laughs> you know, it, it's I mean, great. The, he's a, so prolific. He's such a prolific songwriter. Yeah. Like, the dude literally writes a song every day. Yeah. And uh, I think that's kind of what spawned in 2013. He did his he did a project on YouTube called A Song a Day, where he put out a song a day. And for seven days a week, 365 days, he did it. And that was really yeah. where all three of us Bavonas were heavily involved with working with Tim because he was recording four songs a day trying to just get these songs out and it was it was amazing it's a learning experience yeah it's like a crash course in uh in music or like songwriting because you're just dissecting all these other people's songs and reworking them into a new style to put out that like either that same day or that same week yeah or he'd be like i want to do this rancid song but I, we got to do it in a different style what do you guys think we should do and we're like <laughs> wow. uh, what your song so he's, he's also open to ideas yeah, yeah oh, he's, oh, totally open. So that's the thing. If there's there's a lot of things we've learned from Tim being in the studio with him, and a few of like everyone, you got to try everyone's ideas. Don't shut anything down because you don't know if it's a good or bad idea until you try it. Wow. Um, what else? Don't overthink things is a is a good one. Yeah. Because if you spend too much time overthinking or thinking about something, then you're just gonna you're gonna lose the spark. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So good and then also for us, he is he's such a band guy. Like Rancid's been together for 30 years. So anytime there was like a band, I want to say like a band conflict or something, he's the perfect person to talk to because he knows how to mediate or like keep, you know, talk about issues with the band together. So he was yeah, that's there's a reason why like he was really important to our, you know, upbringing and uh we consider him the fifth interrupter. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. He wore many hats. He was producer, co-songwriter, and then like band therapist. <laughs> but also just friend and brother. Like friend, but yeah, like we'd have him over for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he truly took took you all under his wing. I mean, you know, you're you're his proteges, right? And he, and he obviously loves and respects you all. So um, no, that's 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 pretty amazing. So over the years, um, you've toured with some real heavyweights. I'm just going to throw out some, I'm not touching on all of them. I'm sure I'm going to miss a bunch, but from bad religion and rancid and dirty heads to the boss, mighty, mighty boss stones, uh, real big fish selector. You were on bands warp tour flogging Molly most recently. Right. So, um, and those are again, just scratching the surface, but, but, but talk about how the massive, um, uh, couple tour, the last two tours that you came off of. Maybe yeah. Well, so, the the very very massive tour that we did in the summer of 2021 yes. was the Alamega tour, right? Where we got to tour and play in baseball stadiums with Weezer, Fall Out Boy, and Green Day. Yes. Yeah, and that was and that was rescheduled from from 2020, from 2020. because of COVID, right? So there was right. that uncertainty: are these gonna are these gonna happen or not? To exactly. exactly, yeah, and so that was just, I mean, there's nothing to say. It was insane. Um, I never thought I'd play Dodger Stadium. Yeah, you know? or to any of those stadiums. Or any of the any people in them. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. just crazy. Because even even though we were the first band of the day, doors are still open. They were giving us like an hour and a half for two hours of doors before we hit the stage. So there's still tens of thousands of people Incredible. in those arenas, stadiums, whatever. Amazing. Yeah. 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 And like <laughs> those type of opportunities, they do help you become a better band because. You, you have to, you know, you have to be able to grab the attention of the people all the way in the back. Yeah. And when they're 5 million miles away, <laughs> that's not an easy thing. And so being able to tour with bands like that and analyze them and learn from them has been a huge, uh, huge reason, I think, or like a huge, like, ah, what am I trying to say? It's a huge reason we've, yeah. I think, leveled up. Oh, no, I'm we... sure. I, I'm sure. And were there, uh, I know that was a pretty exp uh, ex extensive tour. Is there, was there a standout date and city for any particular reason, whether it was your performance, the fan reaction, something happened? Well, well yeah. So in the middle of the tour, Fall Out Boy, unfortunately, had to jump off of three shows. Okay. So for Washington, D.C., New York, and Boston, we got an extra 15 minutes of set time. 
So instead of playing for 30 minutes, we had to play for 45 minutes. And nice. instead of going on an hour and a half after doors, we were like two to two and a half hours after doors. Okay. It condensed the whole show. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget Boston specifically was one of the most exciting Is shows. It, was it Fenway? Yeah. Yeah. Fenway. So yeah. not not just because of our performance, but also at the same time, Billy Cottage, who plays trombone and keyboard with us, is uh he's a New Englander. He's a New Englander, he's from New Hampshire. Or no, well, born in Connecticut, born in Connecticut. lives in New Hampshire. <laughs> but just a boom coming. Yeah, big time Fenway guy. So just him on the watching him on the stage <laughs> made me so happy because he was like just yeah. shocked. And yeah. awesome. he's got such a chill personality that to see him kind of tremble a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's but, pretty amazing. But, those, but yeah, specifically those three because we got to play longer and the crowds were bigger because we were on later. Sure, they those were incredible. But then yeah, Dodger Stadium was huge because yeah. that's our hometown. Wrigley Field. Wrigley Field was insane. Yeah, these iconic baseball exactly. yeah. yeah. with 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 three monster bands. I mean, you know, um, yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. Um, and then what about the most recent tour? Yeah, so with Foggy Molly. Yeah, a lot of wow, what a great yeah. band they are. That was a lot of fun. So that was it's um, that was more of like our own tour because we were co-headlining. So um, it's kind of nice to get back out. And being able to do our own show, see our fans longer, uh, longer set, longer, yeah, longer set. set, and then to be out there with a band like Floggy Molly, who also has great songs, great live show, great yeah. fans, great fans as well. Like, and we yeah. like it's us trading fans now. It's like we bring some of ours, they bring some of theirs, and see who ends up taking away the most or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really like that, but that's why you do co headliners. Like, our fans will like you, your fans will like us. Of and that's, course. Yeah. Well, and I think. But with that tour, we got to bring the skints out. That's what I was gonna say. The skints from the UK, great, great group. Yeah. And probably my favorite band at the moment. Um, I don't really ever want to tour with any other band. They're so <laughs> fun. Yeah, they're they're great. And so uh they were great. We had Tiger Army out too, also grew up listening to them, legends. Yeah, like Billy, it's yeah. just a good tour all around. Yeah, yeah, and um and then speaking of live performances, you just came from Mexico City, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Right? Yeah. So this past weekend, we played Hell in Heaven Metal Fest in Mexico City. Um, our first time down there it was we've been getting requests to go down there for 10 years, like literally since we started. So it was great to finally go down there. And it, it was amazing. It did not disappoint. It didn't disappoint. Great crowd. So it was a metal festival, but there was the ska stage. Yeah. So it was headlined by uh, Ska P and then Pantheon Rococo. And we played. Oh, and I'm um, Voodoo Glow Skulls. Voodoo Glow Skulls were there. It was T1 and O. Right. There was a wow. Our stage was very, like, we didn't know going into it because it was a metal festival, but we showed up. Our stage was ska all day. That's yeah. cool. That yeah. is yeah. awesome. And we didn't know. We were like, oh, good. Okay, cool. Because we were kind of like, what are we doing at a metal festival? Like, Kiss is headlining tonight. Yeah. Anthrax is playing. Like, what are we doing here? And, and, but and, it was and really, know, really cool. And I know Junior's had some experience in Mexico City. Junior, you've experienced some of the, the ska fans down there, right? Yeah, man. The most, um, it's hard to describe. Uh, as Derek Morgan would say, Derek Morgan said numerous times, he knew something was happening there. <laughs> Because yeah. uh, yeah. just about everywhere that he performed, there was always someone asking, when are you coming to my country? That was before he made his debut, I think, 2012 or thereabout. So he knew something unique and distinct was happening in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you have to experience it. You can't, you can't explain. You can't wait to go back. We yeah. laughed and we're like, wow, we have to go back. So now you're wondering why it took you 10 years, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. so the regret and the sorrow on you guys. <laughs> now, you need, now you need a headline. For waiting so long. Yeah. Um, so outside of Bob Marley, who would you want to go and tour with? Uh, you can tour with Bob Marley. Or the original Scatterlights. Who else? Well, are you saying Alive or Dead? Or you know what I mean? I, 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 know, I give you the oh, Yeah, Live or Dead. This, <laughs> <laughs> the sky's the limit. <laughs> Um, I think we still have a little dream of touring with the specials. Yeah. 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 Um, we got to do a festival with them over the summer um, mm -hmm. in England. And also, we actually, this is another story, but in February of this year, we did a charity event where we got to back the specials. Well, it was a 
Terry and horse. And then I played drums. Justin played keyboards. Uh, Kevin played guitar. Tim Armstrong played guitar. Billy Cottage played Billy trombone. Cottage played trombone. Uh, Johnny Christmas from Real Big Fish played trumpet. And then, um, then special this is the, Anna, the backup. Yeah, this is the rock and roll, the rock and roll circus uh, event, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a charity called Muzak run by Donna Carey where they raise money and funds to help buy guitars to donate to underprivileged Amazing. kids in schools. Yeah. And it's, it's great. We've done it a couple times. On a idea, he's like, I want the specials to be by the after. Like, what? <laughs> um, so we played a whole special set. That's amazing. Terry and Horace. <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. to play a whole like twelve special songs on the drums. Yeah, it was amazing. The, the funny thing is, the whole thing kind of got overshadowed on the internet by Jesse Michaels coming up and doing sound system with us. And then there was a whole. Is it was it an op op IV reunion? Before this, we did the special set. There was we. Yeah, so we did three songs with Tim. It was like the Interrupters and Tim. We did um, Family Family by the Interrupters, Time Bomb by Rancid, and then we did Sound System. And Jesse Michaels came out to sing Sound System. Yeah, and Everybody filmed it, and it went up on the internet on Monday. And everyone was like, oh, my God, I'll buy a green. And it right. reignited that whole conversation. But we're sitting at home like, but we, we played with the specials. Yeah, I was in the specials <laughs> for 90 minutes. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. yeah and, 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 any rehearsal before you go on stage with the, with the special? Yeah, two days in the studio before that. Yeah, and oh, uh, that okay. was also really cool, just because you got to hang out with them. We were just, yeah. you know, it right. was cool for me because we take a break. I go up to Horace. Yeah. I'm playing piano, but the whole time I'm watching Horace play bass because as a bass player, I really admire him as a bass player, and I've yeah. looked up to him. So we we finished like nightclub, and we're taking a break. I go over, hey Horace, um, in the end of the solo, what what's that line that you played there? Because I think I know it, but I'm not sure. And then he showed me like this. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm like, ah, I knew it. Okay, cool. <laughs> and where was this again? Where this took place? This was in a, it's in a backyard in the middle of Los Angeles. Yeah. The, at Don and Carrie's house. He, yeah. He's a he's a comedy writer. He used to write right. for he wrote for the city. and uh, he's he's got a laundry list of accolades. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's always uh, a really fun event. I, I saw yeah. some I saw a, some footage and some photos. Yeah, we did it a few years ago too, where uh, Horace played and we had uh, we, Linval was there. We and backed up Rhoda. Rhoda. We backed up Rhoda. Yeah, Rhoda the car, right? Yeah. Is that is so, that how you met? Is that how you met Rhoda? Because. Um, on your on your no, actually okay so here's the story about how we met rhoda the very first time we ever toured the uk was in april may 2015 we'd never been there before we got we did like the small run of shows where it was all less than 100 cap rooms kind of yeah yeah except the london show was in islington that was the only show i think we played the show and we used to after every show we would go to the merch table and hang out and talk to fans take pictures just you know be be men of the people be of the people <laughs> so we're doing that and at, at, out of nowhere we've noticed rhoda standing there in the corner of iron go, oh no way rhoda and she goes no no don't don't mind me just keep doing what you're doing i'll be here so she stood there for like an hour while we did all this fan meet and greet stuff and then when we finished she was there and she was just like that was incredible and then we got to meet her and talk to her yeah. and she was a such a fan and so genuinely nice to us and right. that was the first time and we just couldn't believe that she stood by watch the whole show, just meet the fans and, and then, then we, still had time to hang out with us after every time we go to london reaches out or we reach out and she comes to the shows and we hang out to the point where full circle this last tour we did in the uk we headlined at Brixton Academy, which is a legendary venue. Yeah, man, real upscale. Yeah. Up exactly. She has came out to the show and said she's never performed on that stage. She had been going there since she was a little girl when it was a movie theater. Yeah, yeah. And she had never been able to perform on the stage. So we brought her up to perform. We did As We Live off our new record. And then we did Let's Do Rock Steady by The Body Snatchers. Oh, that's And cool. that was another moment for us where we, you know, you meet your idols or your heroes, people you look up to who have like kind of paved the way in this industry, but you never think that you're going to give them something back. Yeah. And that was kind of a moment for us where like, 
she was on that stage enough to just cry because she almost made me cry because she says like on the mic yeah. she had told us a little before the show but on stage was when she was like i have been coming here for 60 years and i've never even stepped foot on this stage wow. and we're about, I'm about to count off the song and i'm like oh oh wow, oh, wow. <laughs> that, yeah. that's heavy that is so special yeah how amazing that you could uh have her help her experience something you know so meaningful um and, and i could tell through social media that, that she is such a big fan and, and, and respects and loves you guys so um yeah that's that's super amazing um and then when and then how did that specific song that's on the album with her and, and tim come about hold on your uh, audio is getting a little iffy oh can you hear me now um how, how did the song how did the song on the album come about with her and tim so that song so that was a song we already had well like when it was written it was written knowing Tim was going to be a feature on it. Okay. And uh, I think as we were working on the record, that that verse just kind of stayed empty. And and we always knew we wanted Rhoda on this record. Yeah. And the idea got floated around. And I think I, I think Kevin just reached out to her and said, hey, we have a song we want you to sing on. And she said, absolutely. So he sent it to her. She laid down her verse and sent it back. And it was perfect. We kept I everything really- she did. And she'd even come up with that part at the end where um, she says, love is an answer. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, yeah. And so then like we took that and threw, threw it more in there because it was, it was so good. Yeah. That one, that's a really, we're really proud of that one. That was really fun to do live, especially when she comes out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I bet. And then you have a song with uh, Greg and Alex from Hepcat. Yes. Yes. Which that uh, also so that has also kind of just always been a pipe dream of all of us in the band and is we've always wanted to not just do shows with Hepcat, obviously, but we've always been like, what if we could get them on a song? That would be so cool. So while we were working on this, Kevin managed to reach out, I think just through Instagram. And obviously yeah. we we had met them before. Greg came up and we did We oh, did I Can't Wait at our Say It Out Loud album release show. Our second, at the Rocks our our second album release show in 2016. We brought Greg up and did I Can't Wait. It was oh, very really, cool. really cool. Um, yeah. yeah so but that was a shot in the dark just being like hey i would love as a sin hey, well, it was just a matter of getting everybody together at the same time and so we scheduled a day they came to tim's studio we set them up um two mics simultaneously and they sang together live oh, yeah. and it was an amazing thing to watch them work out these harmonies yep and yeah. figure it out and they were laughing and having a good time and we we're just, just sitting there day. in the control room like this is awesome. Like, <laughs> I never thought we'd have Hepcat on one of our own songs. So. Yeah. Well, and those and those guys, Dream uh, Greg Lee and Alex, Desert and Hepcat, no strangers to to Tim or or Hellcat Epitaph, either. Just you know, having released uh, at least a couple albums on that on that label too. Um, and then you also had to feature yeah. uh, the Skints that we talked about earlier, right? They're on they're on the latest album. Another another great powerful tune. Um, and, uh, and I'm losing you. Oh, how about now? Yeah, yeah, there you there go. It is. Oh, okay, Sorry. cool. Yeah. The last thing we heard was the skins. <laughs> oh, I was just saying the skins are our feature on this on on the latest album as well. Um, and you and you met those you met that band from touring overseas. Um, I, honestly, I think I'm trying to how do we meet them. I think Kevin, we obviously knew about them before we met. Yeah, them. Yeah, we were fans we met of this before we met them. They came out in 2016. Yeah, and they were on. Tim had a radio show on Sirius that Kevin co-hosted, and they did an episode with them. Oh. So they were at Tim's uh, like office studio. And they might we went and watched them. Just been fan for years. And so just trying to link and play shows together has been a, and it's finally worked out recently. Yeah. Yeah. And then getting them on a song was just, again, we had a song that was like, I think the skits would sound really cool on this. Yeah. And so Kevin reached out, sent them the track. They did all their stuff, sent it back. We used everything that they put on it because they're super talented. Yeah. And uh, yeah, stoked. Great, great group. I've not had the chance to see perform. Um, but I, uh, Devin Morrison, who who we talked about earlier, and and Roger Rivas, who we also talked about from Agrilites. I don't know if you ever watched their um, reggae pod clash, 
um, series that they had, you know, their podcast episode, they interviewed the skins, uh, a couple of the members. Yeah, little, yeah. That was super cool to hear that one. So, um, yeah. And this latest album, definitely you all stretch, right? You, you have elements of, 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 of alt rock, ska, you know, reggae, even, even some, some, um, uh, other Jamaican ele uh, elements, um, that was all by design. And is that something that, that you see, uh, maybe in particular, uh, you're going to keep going down that road or is it, is it kind of specific to this album? I mean, it's specific or to remain to be seen. It, yeah, it remains to be seen. It depends on the song. So yeah. for this record, we, pr we tried to just approach each song and make them the best they could be without trying to squeeze them into a box that of some preconceived notion of what the song should be. We just yeah. let the song develop into itself. So that's the thing. Like, like if Amy had an idea for a song melody and she's singing it and it's in like a triplet three feel, yeah. like my heart, we're like, okay, we can't, we're not going to try to take that and squeeze it into a four on the floor for Scott song. Sure. Cause it's not going to, not going to emote the same emotion that Amy's singing right now. So with a song like that, we just approached it from where the song was coming from her and that turned into like this really cool doo-wop kind of Phil Spector-esque rock song. Yeah. And the more and more we've the band, we've come to realize that if I'm playing, Kevin's playing guitar and Amy's singing, it's going to sound like the Interrupters. Like we, we don't have to be playing a certain style for it to sound like the Interrupters. So that was always in the back of our mind on this record, which made us more comfortable <clears throat> kind of getting out of, I don't even want to say our comfort zone because we're comfortable how we're playing on this record but getting out of that box that i think we don't want to get squeezed into you know of course yeah no oh, I, I think this latest album definitely helps with that as well um junior I knew so you is that your fourth uh, so that's your fourth uh studio release album the wild right. is that oh. the one we're talking about that's right uh-huh right how is it doing so far so far so good i mean it it charted in germany yeah, it had a really it had good, a good debut. Yeah, and the overall response from our fan base has been really, really good, and we're really looking forward to learning because we didn't learn all the songs yet for this last tour, but we're gonna learn all of them and try to play all of them on the next cycle next year. Nice. Yeah, we're just very proud of it too. Yeah. Like, it Amy really got personal with the lyrics. It tells her story in a way I don't think most people might be prepared for, but um, right. it's is that good or bad? It's good. good. It's good. Mm. Like, so w Amy used to like when she would write songs, she would write in a uh, in like a third person kind of like you or they kind of perspective. And on this record, she finally realized if like I want to connect with people, I got to tell my story. So it's a lot of first persons and it's a right. lot of truth, a lot of stuff that she realized she hadn't written songs about. And uh, I think a lot of people connect <clears throat> with the messages and the stories that she's telling. Yeah. And our job was just to make sure we don't get in the way of, of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh how about the royalty? Are you split the royalty check? Uh for instance, if I do most of the writing, then <laughs> evidently and obviously, uh practically all the money comes to me in a group. How does it work? Yeah, well, I will say. You know, I, I'll use one example. What we do for is you. fair. I mean, um, you know, John Lennon would always emphasize that the guys in the band should not yeah. just play instrument, but their name should be attached to the song, so that down the road their family can get royalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We but do all share. Ideas. We uh, do if all share. your name is not on the song. Sorry, what was that? If your name is not on the song as the author, how do you get royalty? Oh, um, well, you know, I, don't know. I think we're all, I think we split everything even. We we split everything oh, there you pretty go. evenly. Yeah. yeah. Nice, uh, nice, nice, nice. And even nice, if it's not yeah. even, it's it's fair. Yeah. yeah. So, that's what's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, honestly, that's, that's very important. Yeah, honestly, though, that's not, that's not what we live off of. Like, we have to go on tour to make any money, <laughs> which isn't but even. Nevertheless, money. nevertheless, down the line later on, you know. Yeah, you yeah. Come home and find an odd job to make money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. True, true. Um, mm -hmm. When you're on tour, um, 
or, or even just just based on um, when you have new albums coming out, new music, how do most media outlets and most uh, people out there, or even fans, refer to you all? Meaning, meaning, not that it's about genres, but I'm just curious, like, like because because you all do, I feel an amazing job at, at making sure, even though you're not a straight, say, traditional ska band, right? You 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 all clearly do wave the ska banner in some way, right? Fashion. Um, do do you think that most media outlets and most fans know that and and and, and no. feel that? i don't i that's it we get i mean we get all, all of them from we're a ska band to we're a punk band to we're a ska punk band right, right. And it's, it's really whatever anybody wants to say like i think I, we all think of ourselves as a rock and roll band you know okay like, yep. again we take, take influences from punk and influences from ska and try to make it as purely representative of ourselves as we can. Um, but we'll t whatever you want to call us, we'll take yeah. it. Yeah, we had a actually really cool story is Elton John had a radio show on Apple. Yeah, it was Apple. And uh, he played one of our songs once. And he comes back from the break and goes, that's the Interrupters. He actually played a song called Leap of Faith. Wow. Which is more of a traditional Jamaican beat. Yeah, it's, it opens with a buru drum beat, and then we're we got it's a like a Lloyd Nib style ska beat. Yeah, yeah. So he played that, and he comes back out of the break, goes, "That's the Interrupters with Leap of Faith," and they're a ska punk band. But I don't care what you call it; they make great music and they make up music. That's the Interrupters or something like that. And, and we're like, okay, so it's up right? music. That's from from all Sir, of it is up music. From Sir Elton John. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, I mean, listen, I think exactly. <laughs> A lot of respect for um you all taking the music that you know and love and, and you create your own sound. I mean, you know, if, if you think about a band like Sublime, right, they did that. You know, they they were not trying to to emulate anything, right? So um yet at the same time, a band mm -hmm. like Sublime opened the door to a lot of uh I'm sure to to to, to reggae to a lot of fans, right? And so you never know what your fans might take from from your music. So yeah, that's great. So I know, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, they have a Kera uh, acoustic Christmas uh, just around the corner, right? Yeah, it's this Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, you guys are looking forward. What sort of preparation you've made so far? Well, well, since we just played in Mexico the other day, we're <laughs> well rehearsed. I think we are going to practice uh, the day before just to make sure we're ready. But um it, this is our third consecutive time doing it. We did it in 2018, 2019, and they haven't done it since. They didn't do it wow. in 2020 or 2021. So we're very honored that we've been you're asked like, you're like, I you're like, I'll <laughs> I know, third time in a row. And like, we love them. Over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're excited. So we're what can find they were forward to 2023? Coming out of 2022 with such high energy. 2023 uh, makes me go city. Cheer up. Wow. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, we've what got young we're fans look we're forward to in, in, in the next uh, 2022, next year? Concerts. Lots, lots of, concerts. of concerts. So we're working on a tour, which will be announced very shortly. Yeah. And that'll be most of the spring and the summer mm -hmm. that we're working on right now. Um, we're honestly we're trying to play everywhere. We want to take this around the world and play as many That's shows. That's the whole idea. Nice. Exactly. Yeah, the right album we have announced is we're going to Japan in March. We're doing will the this, Punk Spring. Will this be your festival. first time in Japan? No, we actually we went in 2019 for the Summer Sonic Festival. Oh, nice. And then we actually turned that in, we turned it into a live record. Because the the show just went crazy. Live in Tokyo. Oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I knew that. Right. Very. Cool. I saw that. Um, yes. Yeah. So like that, we didn't really know. What to, we didn't know what to expect from that, and that was our first time going. It was our first show in Japan, and we played in. Uh, it was a festival, but it was like an airplane hangar, like ten thousand people, and they were very enthusiastic, and they knew a lot of the words. And we finished the show like that was amazing. And then we were backstage and a representative for the festival came back and said, hey, do you guys want to buy the video footage uh, that we live streamed wow. and the multi-track? And we were like, 
Yeah. yeah. So like they got in touch with our managers and they gave us a very good deal on it. And so we bought that with no plans, with no plans. We were just like, yeah, we want, we're hoarders. First yeah. of all, back backstory, Justin and I are digital hoarders. We have files upon files that go way back. I have every show of this year, 2022 recorded multi-track wow. and multiple go angles. Yeah. We just I maxed out a five terabyte hard drive already. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. So we're, yeah, we're weird like that. But so when that opportunity came, we were just like, yes, absolutely. We want to own that. And, and then, so we bought that and then flash forward to we're in the middle of COVID and we're like, can't do anything. We start, you know, shuffling some ideas around and it was, why don't we turn that into a live record? It was so good. And we have video for it. We can put out a live video with it. And then that snowballed into, well, what if we made it into a documentary too? So now we have a hour long concert film documentary on YouTube called this is my family and it's uh the live japan concert intercut with documentary footage of our lives and our band story cool and stories that. and stuff yeah, yeah. Wow. but so that was the first time we're and ever since then we've been eager to get back yeah yeah so okay. repeat so it that, again for, repeat it again for fans who may want to go check it out live in tokyo and the movie, movie is called this is my family it's on youtube it's on youtube yeah if you just look up the interrupters this is my family mm -hmm. on youtube you'll find it Okay. Fantastic. We did during the, the lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where else do you um, hope to go next year internationally? We're trying to get down to Australia. We're Every trying to get down to South America. Honestly, everywhere. Every yeah. Um, Seven like seas. Right now, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have uh, the United States, Canada, Europe. We have stuff on the books right now. Uh, not announced. It's coming out. It'll be out soon. But uh, just everywhere, anywhere that will have us. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's you know, that's the right outlook. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere and everywhere. <laughs> anywhere and everywhere. Um. What What advice would you give for um, maybe for for bands that are are starting or, or um, you know, or, or maybe those that have have been given mixtapes from from uh from their old uh, childhood friends just like you were back in the day but but um uh any any advice in, from what you've learned over the years especially maybe some of the advice uh or or, or what you've experienced during covid and that's you know such a, a major and un certain time period and um or what you learned on the road yeah i mean i think playing shows is the most important and if you're trying to start a band and be somewhat successful every single person in the band needs to be on the same page you can't be in a band and have one member that's like oh but i got my day job so like i can't i can't make it to rehearsal or like oh i have a night job i can't make that gig yeah like every like the, yeah. the which is hard to do it's hard to do. We're, the we're a family so that i think that's why we were able to do it is because well obviously we grew up together uh that helps but if you're not all on the same page, it's not going to stay together very long. And that is know? so difficult next to impossible, um, but um, yeah. That would be a main, main thing. Same page. No, that's super mm -hmm. important. It is, yeah. it is. Yeah. Really? Especially, let's talk about ska. Like, if you're in a ska band and there's seven people in your band, it's hard to keep seven people on the same page. And also, it's hard to play a gig and get enough money for seven people to live off of, so... <clears throat> It really is about just finding the right hustle and uh, kind of buckling down and just focusing on what's important. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, true. Right? Well, let's hope you guys will have, uh, can give up your nine to five and just, you know, uh, make a living as a musician. That's the goal, right? Yeah, we're, we're trying. We're trying. Mm -hmm. That is the goal. That is the goal. Because, <laughs> you know, they say if you find a, what is it? You find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Right, I feel like I haven't worked in years. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. Um, any um, I think as long as like we. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, like, as long as I can pay rent, I'm happy. You know, that's all that really matters. As long as I have a roof over my head and I can do what I love, that's all that really matters. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's 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 so true. Um, what um, if if you were given the opportunity to, uh, to record and play with uh, any any ska legends i know you mentioned uh specials um you'd love to tour with but but any um any any jamaican ska legends that you'd uh that you'd you'd love to perform with 
Uh, I would love to sit in with the Whalers. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh, I, original you know, Whalers. Original, yeah. I, love, I would love for Family Man to just hand me his bass. Right, right. <laughs> yes. I would just sit there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of them have passed on. Like Justin Hines, I'm oh, a yeah. huge fan of, and uh, I I see photos and videos of him in California in like the '90s and stuff, and I just think like, man, I'm like 10 years. I was 10 years too late yeah. to see him or something. Him or like Prince Buster. Um, yeah. Yeah, we Luckily, we did get to see Scatolites with like Lloyd Nib on drums. Oh, nice. I think with bass too. Yeah, that like fifteen years ago or whatever. So I I, I like I, I'm happy that I got to see that. Yeah, they were um, glad you have those. Were... Yeah, Junior and I had the pleasure oh, of working. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna reminisce. They used to do that Ragamuffin Bob Marley Day Festival yeah. in Long oh, Beach. Oh, yeah. yeah, we used to go to that all the time. I'm just trying to remember who we. I, I know. That, I know that Alton Ellis. Uh, yeah, like Alton Ellis, Ken Booth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we saw Junior and Stranger I. Stranger Cold. Yeah, uh, Derek Morgan. Um, Derek Morgan. Alton uh, yeah. rather. Uh, 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 Justin Hines as well. Junior, Junior and I had the pleasure of working with Justin Hines in '97 or '98 in Pasadena. Um, it was a show that he headlined with um, Ocean Eleven. I think the Israelites and one other group were on that one. Um, but yeah, and Prince Buster unfortunately never came down here to uh, to SoCal. Um, right. he, he played Sierra Nevada World Music Festival twice. Um, one of which the Agrolites backed him, and yeah. then uh, and then one of which the Rhythm Doctors. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So that was pretty amazing. But yeah, unfortunately, never never in Southern California. And it is not because of lack of effort. <laughs> no, true, true. Yeah, yeah, true. Junior, I think. In fact, I think Junior has a poster behind him somewhere that has. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Prince uh, Buster was supposed yeah. to come. He was supposed to play that show at at Poly Pavilion, and and Junior never happened, right? No, so that was my dream. But then after that, I was able to get him to play. I was able to twist Warren arm to get him to play <laughs> Sierra Nevada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it turned out to be a financial bonanza for the promoter. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, true. Um, well, as we as we um end our journey here, uh. Uh, guys, what what have we not talked about that uh, that you want to make sure listeners and fans uh, know about you two or know about uh, the interrupters or the interpreters, as Junior said? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, like if you got if you if you're listening to this and you have no idea who we are, come to a show. Come find out what we're about. we watch. This is my family on YouTube. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, watch it tonight. Yeah. And uh, just, you know, be, be, be positive, mm -hmm. spread love. Nope. Yeah. We, we have know. to do, we have to do That's sort of up. what I call a marriage of traditional with the style that you're doing. Does you, that make sense? Sorry, what was that? Uh, we have to do more integration. That is to say, integrate your style with some of the traditional artists oh, right. when they come to expose people to a broader cross section. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I love um, that. But that's one of the challenge I think that's the challenge you face going into 2023. How we bring different styles together. Yeah. Yeah. There should be more uh, like it doesn't have like more uh crossover crossover yeah. of yeah. Yeah, I don't really like talking about genres that much either, but like, yeah, like it shouldn't just be, if you have a ska show, it shouldn't be, you know, four bands playing Jamaican ska or four bands playing punk ska. You sh it should be a nice and eclectic a mix of whatever, like throw a soul band in there, yeah, sure. throw a jazz band in there or whatever. Like it, the artists and musicians just need to coexist more without the barrier <clears throat> of genres. Yeah. yeah. There is always a lot of discussion about ska and it's the way it dips in and out of the mainstream. Cause you know, there's, there's the, the whole third wave movement. Sure. That, the, 90s boom. the 90s boom, which they kind of consider the last time that it was in <clears throat> the, kind of the public psyche. 
Um, but it's funny because as we've toured for the past 10 years, every city across the country, there is a ska scene in every city. There are fans of ska all over the world. So it's not going anywhere. And I don't really think it's... That's for sure. It doesn't matter if it's on the radio or in the mainstream. It's it's, <clears throat> it's in the consciousness of the people that love it and appreciate yes. it. And it's always going to be. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great. Well, my experience though, and my experience is limited. I don't want to absolutize my experience. But I remember bringing some bands together, a conglomeration of bands, Kia and Reggae. And I noticed that when the Reggae bands are on, people go smoke. And then when you put the scabana on, the reggae people go smoke. They never really came together. It's the same small venue that had about 250 people. Yeah, but see, and that's know, weird. Places like Mexico and England, people just enjoy the music. But here it's... Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. some of that some of that could be Los Angeles people are sometimes jaded, right? And, 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 yeah. yeah. And I bet prefer you say that. <laughs> <laughs> but like... So going back to the officials, when we would when we would be playing Blue Beat or whatever, like we were kind of a our focus wasn't just one style of Jamaican music. We tried to play ska, rock steady, and reggae. Yes. So like we'd have a set and we'd, you know, we'd play I Am Going Home by the Warriors, and then we'd be playing like real situation by Bob Marley, which was like an eighties. Or seeing is knowing. Or yeah, or we be playing some skinhead reggae. Abyssinians. <laughs> so it was always just what like the Jamaican umbrella was what we were trying to live under and what we were trying to expose more people to. And uh so uh, yeah that I don't like hearing that like ska fans would leave when a reggae band would play or reggae fans would leave when a ska band would play. Like that that rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> I, I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Jesse and Justin, thank you uh, again for joining us. Um, and and uh, really, really wonderful hearing about your, your uh, uh, upbringing and, and, and your influences. And, and again, big congratulations to you and, and the rest of the interrupters on, on uh, all everything that you've achieved right to date. And I know that you're all just getting started, um, but you definitely have, have, um, you know, work your, work your tails off. And, um, and I know that you've had such a busy year, so uh, hopefully you can relax a little bit after uh, acoustic Christmas and <laughs> take some time with the family. Right. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. But then come January, we're right back at it. And we're back we're at it. To have a big year and we have some announcements that I, I think they're coming next week. Yeah. Okay. Well, this but, is uh, perfect, perfect timing then. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you don't want to make those announcements now? Or, uh, <laughs> we don't want to. We don't want to get him in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we stop recording, I can tell you something that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, thank you for having us, uh, Junior. Oh, yes, yes, I yes, say, yes. I, I loved listening to you when you were on 103.1. You had that, uh, right? You had yes. a radio show. I think it was Sundays back in the day. Yeah, Man, junior, I miss it. Junior, you're. Uh... The, the, the 90, uh, 90, uh, 92, what was it? 92, three. What, what, what station junior? It was, uh, uh, man, it's so the, much the, reggae mix, the reggae mix show. Uh, so what time period, Eric? Well, the, the one that you were on with, um, uh, sound lab. No, yeah. man, that's long ago. Huh? Yeah. The, the one with Chris, the one with, uh, not Chris. Well, that's like, huh? Am I correct that you you hosted a uh, like an hour long radio a reggae show on Indie one zero three one? Am I right about that? No, no, that was um, was that Wayne? That that that, that was Wayne. It? Yeah, that was Wayne. Wayne. Native Wayne? Wayne? That was that was Native Wayne. Sure? <laughs> I'm yeah, asking. That, was, that was Native Wayne, but but Junior, you heard on um, uh, Junior ninety two point three. So yeah, we, that's ninety two point three Friday nights. We did that for a year with Chris um, Chris Lewis. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And then and then right. Junior and then Junior's also still on um, KXLU Saturday nights, right? Saturday nights. Right. And then okay. and then KSPC Monday nights. So you can find Junior on the on the radio dial and on the. Um, my apologies, I I, I misremembered. No, no, no. All good. That, that, there was a. I do remember listening to a radio show. There was a radio show with you. 
Was it? Is that it? I thought so, but I could be There wrong. was a Jamaican artist that was supposed to be coming. Oh, it was to... Eka Mouse. Oh, Eka Mouse went missing. <laughs> was that was that your show? Uh, there, well, I don't know. I remember I don't we were listening. Eka Mouse was supposed to be in town to do a show, and you came on the radio. I was like, Eka Mouse cannot be found. If anyone knows where it is, please call us. Does <laughs> this ring uh, a bell? That's a good story. I didn't. No, I don't know that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, but but we should say definitely support uh, support uh, your 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 radio specialty shows, right? Um, yeah. Right. Yes. And, and Junior, thank you yes, for sir. continuing to, to to play the music. We should also yeah. thank everyone for um, for their support, and uh, please subscribe to the, this podcast series on our YouTube channel. Follow at History of LA Scare on Instagram and join our Facebook uh, group. This series is produced by a good friend, uh, of course, the great Eric Cola, and by the Rockery Radio. You can find a Rockery Radio on Rockery underscore radio. And please follow uh, Junior Francis at, at Junior Francis. Right. And uh, Jesse Justin, thank you both again. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And happy holidays mm -hmm. to you all. Junior, thank you as always. Yeah, looking forward to meet you guys, and I guess uh, so, uh, maybe we can make some sort of event happen where we bring the forces together, the traditional yeah. uh, with uh, your style. Let's do it. It's still days it's and all the big. I feel like there used to be yeah. a lot more. Don reggae in LA. <laughs> yeah. Some of it is coming back. Some is coming back. Coming back. Yes. Yeah. In 2023. Yes. Yes, indeed. All right. Everyone, thank you for listening and for the support. Get out and um, and enjoy the music. Until next time, Junior, Justin, Jesse, yes, we'll see you all. Bye. Have a good night. Yes, Bye -bye. Thank you for having us. Take care, everyone.